I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Peggy Brunash uh, to the Scotland Against Modern Slavery podcast. Peggy is, well, I can say is a specialist. She's a lecturer in the history of Atlantic slavery at the University of Glasgow. Um, and I think there could not be more relevance to what we are discussing with regards to modern slavery because we have to address historical slavery and in particular Scotland's links. So we have a very qualified and experienced academic that's going to give us some advice. So Peggy, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Sean. Peggy, um, I suppose, you know, given your knowledge and your background and your history, I, I have to open with the issue of human trafficking and modern slavery in Scotland, you know, now and where we are now. You know, this problem, this issue, this, this, this horrible um, human misery, that we have, we've had um, in 2019 record amounts of victims rescued in Scotland. It was over 500. Um, last year, when COVID hit us, um, when everything stopped, we still had over 330 odd victims that were rescued in Scotland. And we do see and predict everything is pointing towards with what we see with the effects of Brexit, the the labour crisis that we see that um, the criminality behind this labor exploitation will exploit this even more, the situation. So we see it getting worse. Now, <clears throat> what we are seeing globally as well, and Esther, we had the Dame Sarah Thornton, the an Independent Anti-Slavery Commissioner for the UK talk about around 40 million victims globally um, held in, in, in some sort of form of slavery, which is just horrible. But mm. the reason I've asked you as a guest to come on, Peggy, is because we're looking forward, but we can't really address what we're looking forward at until we look backwards and look and, and learn a little bit about the history and particularly, you know, in the UK and, and you know, my interest here is in Scotland's um, links with transatlantic slavery historically, which sometimes get publicised um, quite well. I think, uh, you know, Black Lives Matters brought this to the forum and changing the street names of Glasgow and these types of things, but I don't think we have enough education and knowledge about this. So Peggy, thank you for joining us again. Um, I'm going to just gonna, gonna be really, really off, open to you, know, to you. You know, I'm saying about looking back to look forward. Can you give me a little bit of an overview of, you know, that statement there? Of course I can. Most Brits tend to think when it, when it comes to uh, participation in, in the transatlantic slave trade and, and Caribbean slavery and to some extent uh, slavery in North America during the time of the British colonies before what is now known as the US uh, gained their independence. The focus is usually on London receiving the, the, the wealth for the most part, but also more so of the enclaves or the entrepots of, of port towns uh, in England. Now, what is certainly true is that uh, when, it, when we talk about slavery in terms of the transatlantic slave trade and who was part of the maritime Traffic, trafficking, the Scots didn't really have that much influence. In fact, uh, we have records that less than 30 tra uh, voyages were made from Scottish ports uh, to and from West Africa into the Caribbean, right? Yeah. As opposed to in that same period, if we're thinking about you know 1706 to about 1766, in a 60-year period, you had over 1,500 transatlantic slave trade voyages leaving English ports like Bristol. However, the Scots and Scotland uh, as a nation was deeply uh, interlinked with the wider slavery economy, more so in terms of the Atlantic trades with North America and the Caribbean, all the fortunes that have been made from by merchants, and hence why we have uh, Glasgow known as Merchant, or at least city center is known as Merchant City. But Glasgow's other nickname is the second city of the empire. So what's that's not Bristol, it's not Liverpool, 
it's Scotland because there was so much uh, economic wealth that flowed into Scotland, um, not just to benefit the wealthy merchants, plantation owners, um, but it benefited the entire nation. It, it helped to jumpstart uh, pretty much the industrial revolution here. And there's no getting away from that, is there? I mean, I think uh, this is a topic I'm, I'm particularly interested, Peggy, and that's why I'm so honoured to you know, be listening and talking to you. Um, you know, I, the, it's, I, I'm somebody who's grown up in Glasgow around the, you know, we've talked about the buildings and the Gallery of Modern Art and Virginia Street and all the connotations you have with the, 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 the trade. But the more you read into it, and, and, and but this is, this is the, what's kind of frustrates me, you have to really go and dig for it to go and find out how deep this runs through the city of Glasgow, or actually the whole of Scotland. Um, there, there's, um, there's, there's artifacts, there's remnants of, of, of what went on. And I have this thought, Peggy, that, you know, you can't, you know, I, changing the names of, of the street names of Glasgow immediately is not going to make us um, um, for, forget about all of this. It's not this forgetting about it. It's actually, we really need to dredge it up to remember it and understand some of the cruelty and the brutality that went on. Um, and I'm sure that anyone listening or watching will, you know, will have an understanding of that um, of how brutal transatlantic slavery actually was. When you take that connection, you know, you take the wealth that was that was made um, in Scotland, and um, we had a as a nation, we had a big part to play in transatlantic slavery. And so, as a nation, could you give us a little bit of insight in what you think? You know, what, what's your thoughts on this? You know, it's it's, it's deep, really deep rooted, Peggy, isn't it? It is very deep rooted, and one of the misnomers is that it's only about the very wealthy that benefited and that it was mostly Glasgow that this wealth filtered in and stayed there. As you said, there are these cultural remnants in terms of street names. You know, why would there, why is there a street named Jamaica Street or Virginia Street or Tobago Bridge, right? Why is that there? The ghosts are all around but not just in Glasgow. We had over 90,000 Scots that emigrated from the Highlands as well as the Lowlands. So while you may not see those street names in Aberdeenshire or closer to the Western Isles, you still had many that went to try to make their fortune. And they went in, so, in large numbers, not just as the very wealthy that obviously were successful, but they went as doctors, surveyors, as overseers, as accountants. So there were Scots that went in all levels of classes to benefit, to make money. And that money went and flowed back into Scotland in multiple ways, whether within families to inherit more land, but also in terms of gifts, in terms of money donated to building of schools, uh, bequests so that students could receive a higher education and therefore jumpstart their careers and economic growth to prosper their own families. It, it ripples throughout Scotland in so many different ways. Uh, you know, you say that about the schools and about, you know, um, educational establishments, you know, it's well publicized, you know, University of Glasgow, the money that was that was um, contributed from um, people who had made their, literally made their millions in the through the trade. It's not just University of Glasgow. This is endemic. This is this is right through. You know, it's very much so. Uh, and and it's and it's hard. and the more you research, and I, I know that I understand that you know, Edinburgh as a city, when at the abolition times, when the compensation was paid to those who had shareholdings. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Because it blows my mind when you when you hear this. Well, it's quite interesting that uh, the University of College of London created a research project and it's called Legacies of British Slave Ownership, though they, they've changed it a little bit in the title, but it's still the same. And around 2010, they started this project and found out that of the 20 million that was comp of compensation that was paid to slaveholders for the loss of their enslaved property, 
those living in Scotland were over represented in those claims. And a high concentration of them happened to be based in Glasgow. So that's just, just the enormity of how many people were able to apply and receive compensation that we as taxpayers have been paying since 1834 that only ended six years ago, literally six years ago. So we're talking generations have had to pay back the government for the money that they gave to slave owners as compensation for the future loss of money that they would not receive when slavery was abolished. That just blows my mind. Six years ago, so we talk about the COVID pandemic and the cost of the pandemic. And, you know, and there no, you know, you meet anyone and they'll say, we'll be paying for this for generations and generations. But actually, and we have. And, but we're only just finishing paying off the compensation for those people. Right. Wow, right. so a phenomenal amount of money then is compensation. And again, that money will have been used when it was paid out to reinvest in businesses, properties, and and, and, and a legacy that still goes on. Right. So, so much of the, the benefit of municipalities, you know, running water, sanitation, better roads, new buildings, actual jobs, employment for people, especially working in textile and in dust and other industrial uh, facilities was possible because of so much of the revenue made and reinvested back into the nation. Um, and it just, you know, it's just huge, huge. And I think to me is, is there a, like, I, I, I'm re reeling this back now to, to some of the conversations I have with Scotland against modern slavery and education um, and the business community. And on the start of my journey in all of this, um, I would have, I'd be speaking to people who would say, oh, that doesn't happen here. That happens in other countries. It happens in China, it happens in Africa. No, actually, it happens in the UK. And then mm. it went further. Before and, say, well, and now, in fact, before in the past, as well as now, that same argument is still made that, okay, well, slavery did happen in the past, but that was in the North American colonies. That was in the Caribbean. That didn't happen on British soil. And that also is not true. So that's probably quite relevant here because people don't believe, don't believe, don't believe. It doesn't happen here. And then it goes a bit further. It doesn't happen in... It doesn't happen in my area. Well, every local authority in Scotland has had victims of modern slavery that have been rescued. So it actually does. But that's interesting that you see that. So you're, you're talking about now people who are enslaved on Scottish soil historically. Absolutely. So tell tell Absolutely. me some more about this then. This is a... So there are a number of scholars, colleagues that have been working on really delving into the history of people hidden in plain sight, enslaved Africans having to work uh, and be brutally exploited on British soil because there, has all, there, there have been laws that stated slavery would not exist on Britain, on British soil here in Metropole. But when one explores uh, old newspapers from the 17th and 18th century, it's littered with advertisements looking for runaways, for enslaved Africans that had ran away. You, for the most part, most of them were engaged in domestic service. So not because obviously there is not the, the kind of business uh, economic venture that you would see in the Caribbean where we're talking about large swaths of land for plantation, for growing tobacco, sugar, uh, coffee, things like that. But what you had here when you did have the exploitation of human labor uh, based on, unfortunately, skin color, mm -hmm. uh, it was in a domestic sense. And again, hidden in plain sight, there are portraits that hang in galleries where you actually see black servants with collars, gorgeous collars, gorgeous clothing, but it's only to demonstrate the wealth of the slaveholder. And when possible, as in the Caribbean, as in North America and every other part of the world where there was uh, chattel slavery, people resisted and tried mm -hmm. to escape. And so that's how we started 
to gain this understanding that, wait a minute, slavery was happening here in plain sight, but not in the manner that most people would want to question. So in these slave advertisements, these, these runaways, you'd find out that someone has said they will offer a reward for this person that was in their keep country marks, meaning that they came from Africa with, with actual ritual marks on them, dressed in a certain way. Their English is very good. Their English isn't that good. They're of this height. They have these brands on them. It's just amazing the wealth of information that we can glean from these, uh, ad these advertisements about runaway enslaved people. So these were the advertisements when somebody escaped, they made a run for it, and mm -hmm. their owner for the unfortunate term that it is, would then put an advert out to find their, find their slave. And this was happening in Scotland. This was happening. This was happening in Scotland. This was happening in England. It was happening all over all the, the UK. UK. Yeah. So we think that vision of, um, you know, the, the, of a plantation um, and how life must have been, but actually you will have had instances where people were being treated in those fashion, in that same fashion, here in British soil, um, which is kind of like, you know, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm maybe just going to go, go into a little story myself about, um, I live in North Glasgow, in a place, well, just north of Glasgow, a place called Bishop Briggs, and the more you read it, there's a lovely golf club here, and actually that golf club prior to, well, a few generations ago, it was owned by the, the Sterling family, and the more you research about the Sterling family, they were slavers, and they had, uh, or in particular, a number of the family had a plantation called Hamden, would you believe, named after Scotland's National Stadium. Um, but Hamden um, um, in, in Jamaica, and it was renowned to be the most brutal uh, plantation in Jamaica, from what I understand. And it had one of the first slavery, um, slave revolts because of the brutality there. And it was, it was subdued massively through extreme violence. But, um, it's, but that's so close to me. And I did not know that, you know, and, and I'm sure many people don't know that. And this is me going back to the artifacts of, of the history and the education um, of people. Um, and um, if I suppose going to a little bit more about this, Peggy, is for me, I've tried to self-educate myself on all of this because I found it really, I grew up in Glasgow, Peggy, right? I went, studied in high school here. I was in primary school here. I, you know, went to university here. Um, but none of this was ever taught to me and, and even more recently and I know there's a lot more publicity particularly over the last you know 18 months or so and um, thanks to the Black Lives, Matter, Black Lives Matter movement but it's not enough in my head because there's children growing up here that will, will never know the history of the city or the history of the nation Scotland and the United Kingdom because it's not taught or, or it wasn't taught to me at the time what's your thoughts on this you know you're a you're a Highly educated academic. What do, you, what do we need to do for education here in Scotland and in the UK? It's interesting that you bring up that, at least in your experience, you feel that there hasn't been enough attention uh, in terms of education, learning about Scotland's role, participation, connections, links to Atlantic slavery. And I remember when I first moved here in 2006, Everyone was getting ready for the big bicentennial of the abolition of the slave trade that happened in 2007. And there were a lot of exhibitions um, all over the country. And then that died down. Then 2007 was over. You didn't hear anything about it. And as you say yourself, you didn't learn about it in school. And even when I first came, I actually, when I would lecture and as a guest lecturer, I would come into some secondary schools and talk about it. I've actually heard teachers say, "This is the what, this doesn't this doesn't matter." An actual history teacher saying this doesn't matter, while the focus has to be on 20th century history, particularly in terms of World War One and World War Two. Sure, but then in terms of history further back, then it's all about Roman occupation mm -hmm. in Scotland, and then and then that's it. Mm -hmm. So even Scotland's own history about the clearances and all that happened is still is still marginalized. So Scotland's participation in Atlantic slavery uh, has been a slow process. There's 
There are many starts and stops that have happened. There are various reasons for that. Um, for some people, it is seen as too much of an ugly shame to talk about, right? At least with something like World War I and World War II, you can talk about the men and women who bravely fought to, you know, in, in, in support of democracy, in support of independence, to fight against tyranny, to fight against Nazism. So there's, that's the wonderful positive aspect but anything that may have benefited the country that exploited others is something to, to hide. And then what does get highlighted, if at all, is, oh, well, the Brits were the first to abolish slavery. The, mm -hmm. the Brits also started slavery here. So how, how are you going to prioritize one and not discuss the other when one influence the other. You couldn't have the abolition of British slavery if you didn't start British slavery. That makes absolutely no sense. So some people have tried to talk about this as well, you know, this is, it is a shameful thing and, you know, the amnesia associated with this history. And that's when I just stopped them right there. Mm -hmm. Because to use the term amnesia is yet another form of trauma that you are inflicting on the descendants of enslaved people. They were enslaved, they were brutalized, not, they were forced to work, they were raped, beaten, terrorized for centuries, many of them not living beyond seven years. Mm -hmm. Those that did survive trying to eke out some sort of meager existence, but post-colonial mm -hmm. processes made it sure, made and ensured that these, these islands like Jamaica and, and Trinidad and many others would not ever rise economically for the, for the benefit of most of the people. And then you're gonna say, oh, well, we, we forgot. To say this was amnesia is another form of trauma because it puts who as the victim, not the enslaved. It puts Scotland as the victim. We didn't know. It happened to us because that's what happens when you have amnesia, right? Yeah, you like, are the victim. You, you fall over, or you have amnesia, you, you, you hurt hit yourself. Your head. You hit your head. Yeah, yeah. And that's right. Just, I'm unwell. I'm the person that's unwell, isn't it? And that's exactly. Your... It's not our fault. Yeah. But it is. So Scotland needs to take ownership of that. Scotland participated in slavery. And again, it wasn't just Scotland, it wasn't just the UK. It was many powerful European nations that participated. Mm -hmm. But take ownership of that as well as the choice, the conscious choice to neglect, to marginalize that history. And that's the, that's deep, that's really deep because it is, it's, that, it's like you see that word amnesia, is try, it's oh, just forget about it, let's just move on. But you can't really move on. And my, uh, my, 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 my personal view is, is that, you know, now we're talking, you know, and I'm going back to this issue of modern slavery in, in the UK and in Scotland and or globally, um, but you have to tackle the history and the past of, of, of everything that's gone on to really then face into what, what the problem that we face now and how Absolutely. do we deal with it. And as Absolutely. You, say, you can't say it's just, just it's, we're, you know, we're free and we're democratic because, because there's supposedly 40 million people out there that aren't in, in, in the world. So we have to address this and we have to learn about it. And that's really, really deep the way you put that. It's, we can't as a nation in Scotland anyway, just say, oh, well, you know what? Happened in the past, let's just, let's just move on and, and yeah. make, make the world a better place. No, because so many of the other tragedies that we love to highlight Britain's strength was in the past. So just as you want to talk about the horrors that happened in World War One and World War Two, and how Britain maintain was resilient and overcame that, we should also talk about the darker and difficult heritage that also made Britain successful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The most powerful nation in the world, I suppose, is the way to describe it historically. Um, and um, there's no doubt. And I, I, the, the, the history has led us to this point I suppose as a nation and where we are and it's 
accepting that and learning and understanding it. I suppose, Peggy, as well, I think is I was kind of keen, keen to understand a little bit more about, you know, given your knowledge is about, there's learnings as well, right? Um, and there's lots of learnings and, and, and to me, I'd love you to talk a little bit more about what, what's, what, what are the learnings and what are, what is it that we can take from this unfortunate part of our history? We tend to choose to close our eyes to the, the ugly side of our civilization. Mm -hmm. We tend to say, we make excuses. Oh, but that's not me. Oh, only the rich benefited. I didn't benefit. Oh, that had nothing to do with me and my people. We were always working class. We suffered. But we've always been in the entanglement of human exploitation sullies all of us. It benefits all of us in certain ways, but it sullies all of us. And we can never turn a blind eye as an excuse because it doesn't affect you personally. Mm -hmm. While slavery in the past was, in and specifically chattel slavery, was legal, it was never morally acceptable. And people turned a blind eye and said, well, that was happening in the Caribbean. That, that, that didn't happen on, on our soil. But we knew it did. Mm -hmm. We have the records. This isn't hearsay. This isn't something we're imagining. We actually have tangible records that say, the slaveholder said, my enslaved person has ran away. I will pay a fee if you return them to me. Mm -hmm. And that was against the law. That exactly was against the law. And yet, very little was done about that. And here we have another si a situation, modern slavery, against the law. But people are turning a blind eye, and they shouldn't, because what, it doesn't affect them? It sullies all of us. It yeah. does affect all of us. And, you know, that's uh, one, of the, one of the things I've, I've um, understood through this journey that I've been on is that culturally, um, with regards to modern slavery, there has been an element of people saying, well, if it's non-UK nationals, well, that's not us. This is Romanians. This is Bulgarians. This is the 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 Vietnamese. You know, and it's just accepting it's not part, but it's happening here, and it's there's no excuse if that makes there sense. There is no excuse because we are responsible, especially if you visually see it's going on mm -hmm. in your town, and you don't say anything. Mm -hmm. You're complicit in that violence. You're complicit. Absolutely. And, you know, there's, there's many ways of, I suppose, you talk about the, you know, earlier on, about the blind eye to what was going on in the, in the, in the Caribbean and the Southern American states um, for the people that were comfortably living here. And now we're comfortably living here. And there's, you know, as you say, no excuse for turning a blind eye. And I actually, you know, and to, to find out information on how to spot the signs of somebody who's um, been, um, forced to work um, without their uh, with, against their will, if that makes sense, uh, and bonded and bonded slavery and, and modern slavery and these types of things situation is very well documented. And, and there's many podcasts that we can that I have, uh, and also the national uh, slavery modern slavery helpline that gives you all that indications. The thing is, you talk about chattel slavery, uh, Peggy. Can I just you know we've talked about it a little bit. Can you explain what that is? And it'd be great to take that stage take that a little stage further when we talk about atlantic slavery as chattel slavery this is a very unique distinction as opposed to other forms of human exploitation for example the irish the the, the irish the poor english the poor scots uh, uh you know prisoners of war many of them were forcibly against their will taken to the Caribbean to work as indentured servants, right? Another kind of brutal exploitation where many of them did not survive. Their contract was to be uh, situated between five to seven years and maybe an extra year tacked on if they tried to resist. Because how dare you resist being mm -hmm. treated unfairly and, and being uh, violently forced to work against your will. But that being said, it was that person that was treated horribly. 
not that person's wife or husband or children or grandchildren and so on. The distinction with chattel slavery was one, it was to be a status placed upon Africans and their descendants. So there's the racial element to it. Mm -hmm. And by racial element, I mean, if you even have one drop of African blood, you could still be considered worthy of enslavement. But the worst part, as if there isn't already horrible things to say, is that this was a status that was passed on from generation to generation. So not only were you required to be enslaved, but that also meant your children and your children's children and your children's children's children and on and on and on. So no one that you could call family could, could be independent. They literally and legally, and that is the clear distinction, mm -hmm. legally belong to someone else, to someone white. Well, so legislation allowed that to happen. Laws allowed that to happen. And that's- uh... Laws made that happen. Didn't just mm -hmm. allow, oh, sorry, they huh? specified, they made it happen. That is the distinction between, you know, it brutally exploiting someone and their labor, taking their labor from them by force. That's one thing, that's horrible enough. But then to see so far in the future that any child that they produce will also be owned by someone. That is unique. That is why chattel slavery is unique. Well, that's uh, a real deep insight. And it shows you that the, I suppose, the power through legislation, through the lawmakers, the politicians, let's be honest, mm -hmm. um, lay, those who wished to um, pass that, those laws had a huge interest in the money made from slavery. But it had to be supported and justified by the other pillars of society, right? You had to have religion support this. You mm -hmm. had to have science support this. Mm -hmm. So you, it wasn't just about the laws because it is real, it's difficult to physically see someone being brutalized, being whipped to death, being raped, being seeing their children ripped from them mm -hmm. and not say anything. But it has to be supported by the other aspects of society so that even if you wanted to say, look, I'm a white person, I don't own anyone, and I think this is wrong, then you must be punished for trying to go against the law. And so it has to be supported religiously. It has to be supported socially. So, you know, there, there cannot be any sort of engagement with, with people who are enslaved and people who are not. So there must be a physical, social, psychological segregation so that you understand even if you wanted to say something, you would be penalized. Maybe you'll be publicly whipped. Maybe you'll be fined. Maybe worse for going against the law. To me, this is um, probably a great way to to to, to kind of come come to this um, come to the end of this podcast. It's been amazing, old Peggy, talking to you. But what you're talking about here is that the, the pillars of society that really protected this transatlantic slavery you know you're talking about religion and society in general and to stand up and say something against it you, you you would not you would be prosecuted you would be dealt with by the law and and now if we take this to where we are now and and right now i don't think there's one area of society that would not be sick into the stomach to think that what, what we've been talking about is still happening now so be that religion, the state, anyone in society, and this is where we can make a difference. And this is why there's so much that we can be doing as human beings now to never let this, I would say, turning a blind eye, just not accepting that this is happening, ever happen. And the first part of that for me was to accept that human trafficking and modern slavery is happening in Scotland, it's happening in the UK, it's happening globally. And you accept that, 
and you understand that and then you want to do something about it because as you said this is people hidden in plain sight and it's a hugely tragic misery and any of the victims that i've met in scotland and you know supporting them into employment they have these sad horrible stories but those sad horrible stories of the the violence that they were succumbed that they had that that that, that, that it was part of it, the mental um, degradation, the fact that they had no um, self worth, and the and and sadly, uh, you know, historically, uh, those th those who were enslaved probably couldn't see an end to it. But when when some of these victims have seen an end to it, they are so low in their lives that they need support and guidance to bring them up to to the level, a level in society that we can support them. It's just, it's, it's so sad, but we're seeing success. So we're making a difference as a nation in Scotland, I think, but, you know, as Peggy said there um, about chattel slavery, it was enshrined in society. This isn't enshrined in society. This is, nobody accepts this. Nobody's turning, nobody Well, no should. one should. Nobody no one should. should. And, and that's the worry of turning a blind eye is that to do that, says you accept what's happening to someone else as okay. And once you begin, once you go down that road of acceptance, then it becomes normalized that people should be treated so horribly. And then it's harder to fight. And that's why we can't turn a blind eye because we don't want that acceptance to turn into normalizing. And I would say the difference is, well, a huge difference for us now is the world of the media and social media and information and information age. So, you know, we do some work with an um, uh, organization charity called International Justice Mission, and they talk about your consumer buying power uh, globally and understanding what you buy and where it comes from and how that supply chain is, um, how, how open is that supply chain? And it's, it's relatively straightforward now when I hold up my phone to, to get that information about what we buy. And if you think as a consumer, you can make a difference. That's probably the simplest thing you can do is to start with, is to think about what you're buying and where it's coming from or, or learn a bit more about it or ask how, how, how are you sourcing this or how are you sourcing that? And, and, and take a little look in, in, on the news and, and, and you'll find stories, global stories of, of people sadly kept in these conditions that don't seem too far away from what we've just been talking about through this podcast, Peggy, which is this, what makes me a bit sick to the stomach. Absolutely. But again, the more information that we put out there, there's less reason to say, I didn't know. Yep. Absolutely. Well, Peggy Bernash, you have been a world of information. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been an honor talking to you. Um, and please keep up your good work. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm.